Today I'm joined by Professor Avi Loeb, who's an Israeli-American scientist who currently teaches at Harvard. Great school, right? He's also globally recognized for his work on black holes, first stars, the search for extraterrestrial life, and of course, the future of the universe. He's a philosopher at heart who uses physics to answer life's most interesting questions. Definitely check it out. Well, thank you so much for, for taking the time today. Why don't you take a quick second to sort of introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about your life. I know you, you were uh, uh, born and raised in Israel and, and had a fantastic story, uh, you know, uh, coming to this country and then really finding your, your, your place in physics. If you can tell the audience a little bit about that background and, uh, um, and kind of, you know, how you've gotten to where you're at here today. Sure. Uh, my name is Avi Lov, and I'm a professor of science at Harvard University. I was uh, for the past uh, nine years the chair of the astronomy department at Harvard. And uh, I started my life uh, on a farm. Uh, I grew up uh, in Israel and uh, used to collect eggs every afternoon and uh, drive a tractor to the hills of the village and um, uh, think about philosophy. These were the most uh, fascinating questions in my mind, the, the biggest questions that we can ask. Uh, and as a child, that fascinated me, uh, but the um, circumstances uh, for, uh, led me to uh, study physics and math uh, when I was uh, recruited to the military. It's obligatory service. And, and then one thing led to another, and I ended up uh, in astrophysics and eventually at Harvard. Um, my curiosity was always uh, in the biggest questions, and uh, uh, to my... Uh, surprise and delight, uh, astrophysics does address those philosophical questions. Where did we come from? Um, how did the universe start? Uh, is there life elsewhere? And then uh, when did life start in the universe? And, uh, you know, these are questions that uh, are addressed, for example, in the first chapter of the Old Testament, the Bible, and obviously they were of interest to humans for thousands of years. And uh, a uh, great thing right now is that we have the scientific tools to address those questions. You know, it's interesting that that was your journey because it, for me, it feels like philosophy was an early attempt, at least uh, the, you know, some of the ancient uh, philosophers, there was this early attempt to figure out what, a uh, what physics is really sort of, at least now, uh, starting to, to figure out or describe in a modern way. And right. so, you know what I mean? Let's talk a little bit about, you know, sort of the elephant in the room here, which is what happened in 2017? Sure, I will be. Uh, but before that, I wanted to comment on what you said. Uh, sure. Um, uh, the Greek philosopher Aristotle argued that uh, the earth or us are in the center of the universe. And that was the prevailing view uh, for a thousand years. Uh, it was a very reassuring view. Uh, we are at a privileged place and we are very special and unique uh, in, our uni in the universe and there are spheres around us. Uh, and then, as it turns out, uh, with Copernicus and Galileo, uh, by observing uh, the planets, um, they realized um, that, um, uh, in fact, the Earth moves around the sun, and we are not at the center of the solar system. And moreover, the sun moves around the center of the galaxy. Uh, that's, uh, that was found later. And then the galaxy is one of many other galaxies, trillion, a trillion galaxies in the universe at large. And there is no center to the universe. So, uh, it reminds me of uh, my daughters when they were very young, they tended to think that everything centers on them because they witnessed only their immediate environment. But once they went out to a kindergarten, they saw other kids and they got a better perspective about their place. Um, and um, uh, so while we still appreciate the, the fact that we are not at the center uh, of the physical universe, there are many people, and in fact, most of the scientific community believes that we play a, a very unique role uh, in, in the biological universe, in the living universe, that we are unique and special, and perhaps we are alone. And uh, in my view, the only way for our civilization to mature 
is to go out to the cosmic street and meet others. Um, and the, the problem is that right now, the scientific community is not searching, for example, uh, for technological signatures, uh, industrial pollution on atmospheres of other planets, relics of uh, other civilizations and so forth. And that brings me to the story of um, Oumuamua, which was uh, the, the first object that was discovered uh, near the Earth that came from outside the solar system. And we know that it came from outside because it was moving too fast near the sun. Uh, it couldn't be bound gravitationally to the sun. And all the objects that we previously saw uh, within the solar system were bound to the sun. Uh, meaning that, for example, the planets... Comets, asteroids, these sort of things. Asteroids, uh, comets, and, and of course, the planets keep moving around the, the sun. And this object was discovered in October uh, 19th, uh, 2017, uh, by a telescope on Mount Haleakala called Panstars in Hawaii. Uh, and uh, it was called Oumuamua because that means a scout or a messenger from far away in the Hawaiian language. Uh, at first, astronomers thought that it's just like the comets or asteroids that we have seen in the solar system, and in fact, most likely a comet. The only problem is that there was no cometary tail. A comet is a rock that is covered with ice, and when it gets close to the sun, it, the ice warms up and evaporates, and you end up with this beautiful uh, tail of gas and dust behind it um, that scatters sunlight, and we can easily see that. And in the case of Oumuamua, there was nothing like that. We, in fact, the Spitzer Space Telescope looked very deeply behind it and couldn't see any gas. Uh, but moreover, as the object was tumbling, uh, the amount of sunlight that was reflected to us was changing by a factor of 10. And that mm -hmm. meant that it has a very extreme geometry, at least 10 times longer than it is wide. Uh, and uh, uh, we've never seen something like that uh, for asteroids in the past, but it, it couldn't be an asteroid because it also deviated from an orbit shaped just by the force of gravity. So an asteroid is just a rock, bare rock without ice on it, and then usually just follows the uh, trajectory dictated by gravity, the yeah. sun's gravity. And in this case, there was an extra push, which is for comets provided by the gases that evaporate, but there was no cometary tail. So the question was, what gives it the extra push? And I should say that in September uh, 2020, just a few months ago, there was another object uh, mm -hmm. discovered. Uh, it's not, I'm not talking about Borisov. Uh, it, it was not interstellar. Mm -hmm. It was just um, moving in an orbit similar to the Earth. And it, it exhibited an extra push for, uh, due to reflected sunlight. And um, it also did not have a cometary tail. Um, so um, it, it turns out that this object uh, was actually a rocket booster from a failed mission uh, in 1966 um, called the Lunar Lander uh, Surveyor 2. And uh, we uh, noticed this object before we associated it with this rocket booster. And that demonstrates that we can tell the difference between the orbit of an artificial object that is very thin or hollow, in this case, because we produced it, uh, and a, a rock uh, where you could get a cometary tail or you don't get a push, extra push at all. And um, that implies, of course, that um, uh, it's possible that Oumuamua was artificial. The question is, uh, who produced it? Yeah, so what do we think in terms of a propulsion system that that may have been uh, sort of uh, navigating or, or pushing more and more. So in that case, the only explanation that came to my mind was um, that it's reflected sunlight, that um, uh, the, ob the object um, reflects sunlight as, as a result of that gets a push similar to a sail on a boat that uh, reflects the wind and pushes the boat. Uh, light itself can exhibit the uh, force uh, on a surface, uh, but you need the surface to be very thin. Uh, and in this case, less than a millimeter thick, uh, sort of like a sail. Uh, and uh, this is called the light sail. And in fact, 
We are currently developing this technology for space exploration. The advantage of that is that the spacecraft does not need to carry the fuel. Uh, it just, the sail reflects light and uh, could potentially, if uh, the source of light is very powerful, could reach very high speeds. Awesome. You know, I, I was watching your uh, recent interview with Joe Rogan, and I, I agree with you. I got to say, I, I know Joe's got a very specific sort of opinion on humanity and, and not to be pessimistic, but I just feel like we are... Uh, we're definitely not the uh, sharpest tool in the shed. <laughs> and, right. you know, it's obvious, right? I mean, wars well, and all the things you were talking about, I mean, it's uh, totally absurd. I mean, I was just chatting with a friend of mine last night and I said, you know, I feel like I'm, I watch the news and am in this, like, uh, in this matrix where I'm like, hello, doesn't everyone see what, what's going on here? This is totally absurd, you know? It's like watching a, a bad infomercial from the 1980s going, do they really expect me to buy this product and believe them? You know what I mean? Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a natural tendency of humans to uh, believe that they're special, unique, and at the center of stage. And uh, I think a much better approach and uh, to start with is modest, modesty, basically mm -hmm. to assume that uh, we are not privileged and the conditions around us are typical. And by now, for example, not only that Copernicus and Galileo were correct, that we are not at the center of the universe, we also know um, and from the Kepler satellite data that monitored planets around other stars, that of other half of the stars that look like the sun have a planet of the size of the Earth roughly at the same separation. And what that means is that these planets could have liquid water on their surface mm -hmm. and the chemistry of life as we know it. So not only that we are not at the center, also the, what we see in our backyard, the conditions mm -hmm. around us are quite typical. Earth-Sun systems are very common and there are billions of them. And how can we imagine that if you reproduce the same circumstances, you would not get a similar outcome. I mean, it's uh, the most conservative and mainstream thing to assume that, that uh, w those environments are common and therefore we are common. And we just need to find out uh, if and how uh, many other civilizations exist. And, and also, as you said, are we the smartest kid on the block? Probably not. No, I don't think so at all. I mean, that's actually a really interesting uh, sort of segue into one of the things Joe and you were talking about, which was, you know, do, would it be interesting for another civilization uh, to, uh, to come here and to, you know, sort of, uh, you know, observe or interact? I mean, there's a lot of theories on what's going on. How, what's the likelihood that we, and this is sort of a broad statement, but that we come from ET origins? Right. So, in fact, um, I, I just uh, had yesterday uh, uh, an essay in Scientific American uh, on this uh, question. And my uh, view is that um, we are not sufficiently interesting for a visit uh, because we are quite common and not uh, very sophisticated. Uh, you can imagine our civilization in a thousand years, in a million years, or in a billion years would be, would develop technologies that we cannot imagine. And the sun formed relatively late in the history of star formation in the universe. So there are lots of suns that are billions of years uh, older. They, they, were, they were formed earlier. And so if um, civilization, technological civilizations formed on them, they are far more advanced than we are. And you know, some of them might uh, prefer not to be in contact because um, um, it, it will just lower their quality of life to contact the uh, primitive Civilization, so they have, they might have a cocoon where they have their habitat and everything they need. And uh, in that case, I call it uh, social distancing on a cosmic <laughs> scale. Um, but uh, it doesn't mean that we cannot learn about them because um, they need to do, to throw trash. And um, just like investigative journalists that look through the trash cans of uh, celebrities in Hollywood. We can, in principle, learn about their private lives say, from the trash that they throw. Now, let's go back to Moa Moa. 
you know, what do we think that the, and I'm with you, like, of course, I, I am probably one of the, uh, the few that I know in my uh, social circle that really wants it to be ET. And, and based on what you've been talking about, um, it seems to be, right? What do we think it's uh, in terms of uh, the, what the object is? Is it a spacecraft that has some sort of organic covering that uh you know that that was sort of you know patrolling the the universe or or certainly this this solar system is it trash you know uh what do we think it is well we don't know because we didn't collect enough evidence and uh, science is evidence driven you need to collect enough data to figure out the nature of something and all we can say at this point is that it doesn't look like anything we have seen before it doesn't look like an asteroid or a comet uh, and astronomers that try to associate it with a natural origin also had to invent uh, an object that we have never seen before, like a hydrogen iceberg, frozen hydrogen, uh, that frankly cannot really survive the journey, or a collection of dust particles that, are, um, uh, that make a cloud of dust that is the size of a football field spinning around every eight hours and uh, reflecting sunlight and therefore getting pushed again it's not clear that that would survive uh, the journey uh, so um, if we contemplate things that in my mind make less sense uh, from natural origin we should definitely consider the possibility that it's of an artificial origin like a mm -hmm. light tail and uh, we don't know much about it because for example we didn't have a photograph and uh, it was too far away for our telescopes to resolve it uh, only a few hundred feet in size. All we could see is the reflected sunlight from it. But um, the problem was really that we discovered it when it was receding away from us. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like finding a guest uh, that came for dinner to be very interesting only at the time that the guest leaves through the front door into the dark street. And then you don't have a chance to actually examine this, this guest. Um, but uh, there should be many more. Um, since we just uh, surveyed the sky for a few years with uh, pan stars, um, and there will be also a, a telescope following it that is much more sensitive called the Vera Rubin Observatory, uh, we could find many more such objects. Um, there is no reason why the time that we observe is privileged, that only this time, at this time we would find the only object within the solar system. There should be many more, and we could find them. And, now, the question about the nature, you know, it could be space trash, uh, junk, you know, equipment that is not working. Uh, you know, we, are, we have deposited a lot of junk in space. Uh, we also sent a Voyager 1, Voyager 2, New Horizons that will exit the solar system. So you can imagine that after a million years, these, these crafts will lose their functionality. And then they would be just um, defunct um, technological debris. And, Oumuamua could be something like that, or it could, it could also serve a purpose. Uh, it was in a special frame of reference. Uh, it was sitting at rest uh, in the frame where you average over the motion of all the stars around the sun. It's called the local standard of rest. And I talk about it in my book uh, mm -hmm. that is coming out in a few days. Uh, uh, the book is called Exoterrestrial. So all mm -hmm. these details that I'm telling you are outlined in the book and I very much encourage anyone interested to have a look at the book. And so this object Oumuamua um, was located in at rest in this uh, local, you can call it par public parking lot. And therefore you, we cannot associate it with any particular star uh, because it was sort of at rest and we just bumped into it. And that implies that maybe it's one out of a grid of objects that um, fills up um, interstellar space. And one reason for, for it to exist would be uh, for navigation, to find your way in interstellar space, um, or, um, or maybe communication. Uh, it's a relay station. Um, or it could be just you know, a, a surface layer of a spacecraft uh, that was torn apart. I mean, who mm -hmm. knows? Who knows, uh, yeah. What we need is really, a fo I, I think a photograph is worth a thousand words. And so if we discover another one on its way to us, we can send a spacecraft that will be equipped with a camera and take a photograph of yeah. it. Professor, why such 
a response from your colleagues in, in the space. Why so much pushback? I mean, it's like we're scared. Like we want to, we're so scared of this being ET. I don't fully understand that. It may be related uh, deep down to uh, the fear, you know, the ego that people don't want something uh, intelligent or more intelligent than us to exist out there. You know, it's um, sort of like uh, going to a class and not wanting any of the students to be brighter than you are. You know, that, that is a natural tendency. Or it's a pushback that is because there is a lot of literature on uh, science fiction, on uh, there are discussions that are not substantiated by science on uh, unidentified flying objects. So um, it's possible that the scientific community wants to shy away from that. But I find it inappropriate because, you know, if you look back, uh, going back to the dark ages, uh, uh, there were ideas that the human body should not be dissected and analyzed and uh, because it has magical powers and so forth. And imagine modern medicine, if science said, okay, there are all these nonsense being said about the human body. We don't want to investigate the human body. We don't want to develop medicine. We, where would we be? Uh, so science can address any question if it has the ability to do that. And we do have the technology to address um, the question, are we alone? We have telescopes and we have instruments that can be used for that purpose. And I think it's inappropriate for the scientific community to shy away from this question that fascinates the public because the public funds science. Uh, so I don't fully understand. I don't have a good answer to your question. Uh, to me, it sounds um, straightforward. I mean, uh, common sense to yeah. include this question in the mainstream of astronomy. Absolutely. It feels like this existential fear and the media has been you know, for so long painting ETs as such a negative thing in most cases. And some would argue that it's a, uh, uh, you know, a, a campaign by the government to sort of... No, I don't, uh, yeah. I, I don't believe in conspiracies, but uh, I do think, uh, you know, in many occasions in the past, uh, uh, the, the common view, the popular view was completely off. Uh, starting from the idea that we are at the center of the universe, you know that. Uh, by the way, that idea was not uh, less uh, sophisticated than saying that we are moving around the sun. It was a beautiful idea to think that we are at the center of spheres, you know, and it was a very clever idea. The point is, it just didn't describe nature. That's all. Mm -hmm. And it's not about us showing that we are smart. It's about figuring out what nature is. So we can feel very smart, get a lot of likes on Twitter, and say, no, it's never aliens and be happy. But at the same time, all we are doing is maintaining our ignorance mm -hmm. because the way to figure out if we are alone or not is by collecting evidence, looking at data. You know, and if you put blinders and you say, I know the answer before I even check, it's just like the philosophers that didn't want to look through Galileo's mm -hmm. telescope mm -hmm. and figure out that the earth moves around the sun. You know, you started off your book with, uh, a, you know, a great background on yourself and your journey, your family, which is really heartwarming. And, you know, you also mentioned that we're not ready as a society uh, to accept that we're not alone. Let's unpack that a little bit. Why do you think that is at this point? We're in 2021. We have, you know, incredible technology. You know, why are we not consciously ready for this, in your opinion? Well, um, I think it starts with a culture uh, in the academic community where um, for many decades now, um, uh, it's all about uh, demonstrating that you're smart and clever. And for that purpose, you can just do intellectual gymnastics on concepts that have no connection to reality. Uh, such as extra in, in the context of theoretical physics, extra dimensions, string theory, the multiverse. These are considered mainstream ideas that people work on and talk about and brag about and give each other awards and are celebrating uh, using mathem uh, mathematical sophistication to demonstrate that they are smart. And uh, in my view, that's a distraction because uh, what we are supposed to do as physicists, for example, is to understand nature through experiments. Uh, it's a dialogue with nature. It's not a monologue where we say what nature is. And so rather than per, uh, 
chase awards and honors and recognition and improve our image and get more likes on Twitter, we should be focused on evidence and what it tells us because sometimes we are wrong. Nature is more imaginative than we are. And so um, by doing experiments, by looking at the anomalies, so Oumuamua has anomalies. It doesn't mm -hmm. look like anything we've seen before. Let's pay attention to that rather than brush it under the rug of uh, conservatism and just say, forget about it, business as usual, and continue to do intellectual gymnastics on concepts that have nothing to do with reality. And frankly, the public doesn't really care too much about them. And uh, so there is this change in culture that as to, with, with respect to what physics and mm -hmm. science and academic pursuit was supposed to be. It was supposed to be about the subject that we are dealing with, but instead it's about ourselves, demonstrating that we are smart. And, so, and that, I think, th that distortion then misguides the entire enterprise. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so the correction has to be made, I think, first in academia, and then the public, we already know, the public is extremely interested in this subject. Mm -hmm. I see it from the response. Uh, and so, um, obviously, the public will be happy if uh, academia were to, to work on this. And yeah. um, I can see a lot of examples in the past, you know, in the history of physics or astronomy, where uh, things were not popular for a long time, for many decades. And then suddenly, by chance, they started to become more popular and then they became mainstream. There are many examples including the search for planets uh, on, around other stars. Um, and I would be surprised if this will not be the case for the search for life. I think right now there is a lot of resistance and there is a taboo on discussing technological signatures. And I think, you know, if uh, uh, opinions are shifted, and that's what I'm trying to do, mm -hmm. eventually it could become mainstream and people that are born into the that situation will say, I cannot believe that before that nobody did work on this subject. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm, you know, it feels like a lot of people are scared about the impact on our society, that understanding or realizing that we're not alone in the universe it will have, and that it will sort of invalidate our religions and philosophies of um, of our of the last several thousand well, but, years. Uh, but uh, worrying about that is equivalent to me worrying about the fact that my daughters would go to a kindergarten. <laughs> Suppose I just protected them and kept them at home and they would still have this vision that they're really at the center of the world. I mean, what good would it make? Mm -hmm. It's just, uh, you know, ignoring reality does not change reality. You're just missing the point. Uh, and you live your life in an illusion and uh, with ignorance. And if that is the future we want for ourselves, fine. I mean, animals do not, are not curious about the world. They're not trying to understand it. But for me as a human, I really want to know the truth. I want to figure out what the world is about rather than uh, live uh, in my comfort zone and, and not uh, investigate you know, what's around me. And in that sense, knowing whether we are alone or not is important. It gives us a different perspective about our life, about our aspirations. I am always of the view, I'm of the optimistic view, that knowing more is for the better. Uh, even if I have a terminal disease or something that you know, risks my life, I would like to know all the details so that you know, I can plan ahead accordingly. And so information and knowledge are always for the benefit uh, of oh. planning and, and arranging your life in a better way that will fit what you know. Yeah, and and I I'm I'm with you. My my personal take is I think it's it's impossible for us to be alone in this uh, in this universe based on math, and you know and I and then I also have this intuitive feeling that every time, you know, a lot of philosophers and and, and spiritual masters have talked about that that's you know extra sense that we have, and every time I I watch a piece of content or read a, a book or listen to. Uh, the topic being discussed, I intuitively feel that my consciousness or my spirit or my soul, you know, is saying, this is the answer, you know, and yeah. it was funny because I grew up Catholic, um, you know, in a uh, Spanish uh, home here in America. However, I never really sort of, you know, gravitated or felt like what I was hearing at church was real and not in a negative way. I just didn't connect. And it was only after, you know, close to 
you know, now I'm going to be 40 this year, uh, s- s- you know, observing different religions and philosophies and you know, space and, uh, and science, and then being able to sort of see these common threads across all these sort of uh, these, these components. And, and then I started to say, oh my gosh, you know, like I, I can start to see some patterns that make more sense that now allow me to, to feel pretty confident that we're not in, uh, alone in this universe. We have a couple minutes left here. So I, I wanted to yeah, ask you, what's your opinion? Like, I, I know this is sort of a, uh, maybe a, a direct question, but do you think like just intuitively that, that, and then based on all your research, I know you're a scientist and without a scientific method um, and real data, it's, you know, it's, uh, you may be, you know, sort of uh, hesitant to answer, but do you think we're alone? No, no, I think uh, it's quite likely that we are not alone. And moreover, we are not the smartest kid on the block. Um, And um, I think the most important thing that astronomy teaches you is modesty. Uh, First of all, because our planet, the Earth, is one out of 10 to the power of 20 planets uh, similar to it in the observable volume of the universe. So we are really one grain of sand on the landscape of a huge beach. Uh, Moreover, we live only for a short time. You know, that's that's a difficult realization you know both my parents passed away o- over the past few years and i, I realized you know we-, we live for such a short time let's cut the nonsense and just focus on on, on the substance Let- let's not pretend or promote our image pretend that we know more than we actually know and the good thing about science if it's driven by evidence not if it's driven by mathematics the good thing about science driven by evidence uh is that the um, you learn from nature. You just, you are a student and nature is the teacher and it's a dialogue. So you listen to nature through experiments. You see what the experiments tell you, what the evidence tells you. In the case of Oumuamua, it was these anomalies. And you ask, how can I explain that? Just like a detective, uh, Sherlock Holmes, you know, trying to, what are the possibilities uh, that I can imagine that would explain what I see? And then uh, you get more evidence and eventually, you are left with what, whatever explanation remains. And, and that the only thing, the thing that remains must be the truth. That's what uh, Sherlock Holmes argued. And uh, it's, a, it's a great fun to be part of that process where you learn something new, uh, rather than say, okay, I know already the answer in advance. It's never aliens. Uh, we might be alone and the business as usual. That is a very boring, uh, lifestyle and a much more exciting lifestyle is one of exploration and uh, uh, being modest and humble and saying I don't know much I just want to look at the evidence and see what it tells me and uh, then you get surprised sometimes it tells you something you haven't imagined absolutely well professor thank you so much for your time very much appreciated I know you're a super busy guy I am incredibly humbled uh, that uh, you participated today. If people want to pick up your book in a couple of days or learn more about uh, your content and, uh, you know, and, and, and maybe even connect with you, what would be the best way to, uh, to follow you social handles? I know that you'd mentioned you're not heavy on social these days, uh, promising your wife, which was probably a good thing, right? Uh, but what yeah, would be the I, best I, channels? I think she was very wise to advise me. <laughs> she <to>. was. <laughs> but uh, in the sense that it saves me time, and I also think independently. But, but I do, if you just put my name on Google, um, I have a website where I uh, post all of the, um, for example, commentaries uh, in Scientific American, including the one from yesterday. I have a listing of those. And I have a listing of other things I write, uh, scientific papers and videos and stuff like that. Uh, but in general, um, uh, I would recommend uh, checking my book uh, coming out in a few days uh, on Amazon. You can already pre-order it and you will get it next week. Uh, it's called Extraterrestrial. And then um, in general, you can also send me an email. Uh, my email address is on the website. Awesome. Well, hopefully the next time we talk, we've made contact and the, the curtains have been peeled back and uh, we can celebrate. I'm certainly going to throw a party. My wife always says. Oh, I should tell you, you that... Um, um, I found out that there is a, a winery, a very famous winery, Bonnie Dune, uh, in, uh, uh, in California, that uh, it's one of the best wineries uh, that produced uh, a wine uh, after being inspired by the story of Muamua. 
And um, awesome. uh, I actually, when I found out about it, I ordered this wine and I have uh, a few bottles uh, to celebrate uh, once we indeed confirm that uh, an object of this type is artificial. So Fantastic. Well, I'll give you a virtual cheers. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, Professor, thank you so much for your time and uh, have a wonderful morning. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.